All right, so hi everyone. I am Kelly Pollock. I'm the Associate Dean of Students in Social Sciences, and I'm sort of spearheading this effort that we're calling the Emerging Leaders Initiative. So most of you probably know by now if you've come to these events before, Emerging Leaders is something that started in the division last year as sort of a pilot program, and we're ramping up this year. And the idea behind Emerging Leaders is um, really to improve the lives of doctoral students. And one of the ways that we seek to improve lives of doctoral students is to help them think about careers. And careers not just in the academy, but more broadly. And so a lot of the events in this Leadership Lab series are designed to help you start thinking about careers inside and outside the academy, um, all sorts of variety of careers, and not just what are those careers that you could be getting, but what are the skills that you have now or could develop that will help you in these careers. Um, and so one of the things, obviously, that's going to be very important to do if you're thinking about heading outside of the academy is to think about how you communicate, how you communicate what you've been doing, your research, the skills that you have. Um, and I think that this is increasingly important even if you stay in the academy to think about how can I interact with and communicate with people who aren't academics. So increasingly people, uh, professors are going to need grants from foundations, from businesses, things like that. And this is something where you really need to be able to think about kind of how can I talk to people who don't know my field very well. So we have a, a great panel here today. I'll let them introduce themselves. And I hope you enjoyed this event and our other events. If you have ideas, suggestions for other things we can put on for you, please feel free to talk to me or to Bart, who's right there, who's really doing a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day work and getting all of this up and running and doing a great job. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm Renee Basic. I'm going to be moderating today. Um, uh, I'm Director of Communications for the Division, um, been here at the University for many years, worked in various communication functions. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel and then we can get started with some questions. I also want to just let you know that we can make this very interactive, so if you have questions throughout, feel free to pipe up and throw them out there and we'll incorporate it into the whole talk. So, um, To my left here is uh, Rob Mitchum. He uh, has his PhD in neurobiology here from the university, and he's currently the communication manager for the Computation Institute, um, which is um, a joint initiative between the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory. Um, he's also a science writer. Well, that's one of his primary functions, probably the Computation Institute, but also does some uh, writing about music for Pitchfork and some other places. Um, to my right, close right, is Sarah London. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology. Uh, she has her PhD in neuroscience from UCLA, and she's interested in how the brain develops, especially how early experience can alter neural function and behavior. To my far right is uh, Tracy Wiener. Um, she is the Associate Director of the University of Chicago's Writing Program and teaches in both the college and the training program for graduate writing interns. She has uh, lectured in the Little Red Schoolhouse for an undisclosed number of years. <laughs> Um, so this is our panel. I think uh, we have a lot to talk about. Um, so one of the things I'd like to start out by doing is kind of giving a little bit of context about why um, it can be important to learn how to communicate your research to a broader audience. Um, and by a broader audience, um, it's not always just general public. That can also include non-specialists non in your field, but maybe somebody who individuals who maybe aren't as niche in your area or something like that. So there's some value in different ways to learning this kind of skill. So um, why don't we start with you, Rob, um, since you have transitioned from um, your PhD into a career path that is on the communication side. Uh, what have you seen through this transition and the value in, in being able to kind of speak about, well, your research at fir first, your research, and then other research, other uh, researchers' <coughs> projects? Yeah. So. I guess sort of the driving motivation mm. for what I do is I think it's very important and it, it, it seems pretty obvious, but very important to be able to explain research, particularly federally funded research, uh, to the general public uh, to, in some sense, justify uh, the taxpayer money that funds a lot of us. Um, and also just to, uh, as sort of a general uh, raising of scientific literacy of the public uh, whenever possible. So those are pretty like pie-in-the-sky goals, but uh, 
if somebody doesn't do it, it doesn't happen, right? So I think it's really important to have, you know, not just the academic version of what you do, but also sort of the general audience version of what you do. Um, not just to explain to family members and friends who aren't scientific uh, what it is you do all day, uh, but... They're good practice, though. It is good practice, sure. yeah. So. <laughs> Use them as your guinea pigs. Right. Um, but yeah, as Renee said, also, you know, people from other fields. Um, everybody knows science is getting more and more multidisciplinary. Uh, it does nobody any good to get sort of mired in the jargon of your field, and it just, you know, isolates yourself from a lot of... Uh, high potential collaborations, um, and I think uh, it's you know it's very important to be able to you know you don't want to go too far and make it like startupy marketing elevator pitch style, but at least give like a good uh, succinct half hour talk about uh, what you study and why it's important. So are you running a lab? So <laughs> you so you you think about funding and you think about some of the other. Um, aspects of making sure that there's, as Rob mentioned, uh, federal grants potentially and things like this. Have you found that skill set useful for you personally in this in this way? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, is that um, the ability to communicate and communicate effectively to a wide range of people um, is at least as important as the scholarship that you're actually doing because the only way to move forward in your career, whichever path you take, is to get other people to appreciate what you're doing and why. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to, to the money to fund my experiments and the people who are in my lab, that's a real practical <laughs> um, situation. Um, but even just to get people excited, you know, as Rob touched on, getting collaborators and to, to you know, draw resources from other labs, um, it's important that you have, you have a little bit of a story to tell. The story doesn't have to be the same to everyone, right? You have to know who your audience is, um, but you, you need other people and you need to exist within a community which means you need to communicate in in order to uh in order to to move forward so the audience question is a good one tracy i think you probably think a lot about audiences and that's our thing <laughs> <laughs> can you t talk a little bit about um the importance of the that audience question the audience question is the primary thing that you would have to think about actually now as graduate students. Um, it's the big difference between the kind of writing that you're doing now and the kind of writing that you were doing in the past. It's funny how the kind of education that people get in writing when they're at earlier stages in their career does not prepare them at all for the task of explaining the value of their research. Um, and that's because early on you were writing for teachers. Okay, You were always writing for people who had asked you some kind of a question. Okay, um, and your job was to answer that question that they had defined. And now that you're doing original work, okay, your job is actually to explain the kind of importance of the kind of research that you're doing um, to an audience of a mixed audience of experts, okay, and people who are not quite experts in your field, but who are experts in some sort of a neighboring field, and then potentially later on after that, the general public. And that is a huge mind shift and occupies in the advanced courses in writing that we teach for graduate students at the writing program, about half the class, okay? About half the class is devoted to the concrete, concrete ways in which people can explain the value of their research, okay? The other half of the class is about translating something out of jargon and into English, okay? Um, which I, I take that we'll be discussing at some point. Um, but getting that story out and explaining value, okay? I mean, it's not just something that you're gonna be doing when you're talking to the general public. It's something that's absolutely the distinguishing feature of what you are doing even for other experts. Why should your work be valuable to them? Why should it be valuable to an audience of experts in your field, in neighboring fields, then to people who don't really know anything about any particular field adjacent to yours, and then the general public. And all of those are about stepping outside of the box of your research and thinking about your readers and their needs and their values. Getting out of the library in short. Mm -hmm. So, um, the there's this sometimes uh, maybe a misconception about um, the removal of jargon mm -hmm. from um, a talk or from a, a, a brief or something like that it means you're dumbing it down mm -hmm. or it means that um, you're somehow lessening your argument. Mm -hmm. So um, in that vein, 
what what are some of the some of the best ways of kind of moving into that other mindset about explaining your research effectively and not dumbing it down? Mm-hmm. Do you, since, yeah. you were, since you already I got mentioned an idea. it, okay. What she said about telling a story, okay. Now, how do you do that concretely? Okay, here's one example. Increased margarine consumption, okay? That's not so jargony. You know what consumption is, right? But increased margarine consumption versus Americans eat more margarine, okay? Storytelling starts at the sentence level. It's not necessarily specialized terms of art in your field. It's, do you have a verb? <laughs> is there a verb to be found without the aid of a GPS okay, in your work? This is actually technically one of the big differences between prose that sounds jargony and prose that doesn't. It isn't necessarily the presence of specialized terms of art in your field. Okay, It's things about the structure of your sentences that move away from that storytelling mode, Okay, where you're talking about increased margarine consumption rather than about Americans eating margarine. All right? Sometimes people wonder how they think my research is so abstract, how can I talk about it in a way that's concrete? I mean, that's a standard piece of advice when you're publicizing things to people. And the answer is frequently taking a look at some of the terms that you use all the time and saying, well, okay, is it a noun? Can I turn it into a verb? Can consumption be turned into consume, be turned into eat? Who's eating? Is it Americans? Are people going to be interested in these Americans? In other words, there's a lot of stuff that you can do at the basic sentence level to turn stuff that you're doing right now without changing the actual content, okay? Turning that into something that sounds a little bit less like a play of abstractions and a lot more like telling an actual story. In other words, the stuff might be right there, the stuff that you're writing right at this minute, okay? It's in your sentences, and it can be extracted by taking a look at whether or not and exactly how you're structuring those sentences. Maybe a little bit more technical an answer than you were looking for. No, no, that's great. Um, so I had the pleasure of listening to one of Sarah's lectures to our visiting committee, um, and that's a, a group that the visiting committee is kind of a, uh, an advisory board of sorts to the division. And so uh, Sarah came and presented her research at a dinner talk, and um, that was a really probably interesting audience for you <laughs> because it's yeah. they're not academics for the most part, but they also are all uh, have a lot of education. Some of them do have PhDs from the university and things like that. What did you do differently, in, or did you do anything differently when you were thinking about that presentation and then delivering it? So kind of taking it from the writing piece to the actual delivery yeah so um, this this was interesting because um, what what I do just like what everyone does can be very technical and you know I work at um, genes you know we look at the sequence of individual genes and we look at how those genes are expressed in brain cells and where those brain cells are in the context of the in- entire neural circuitry and then we do behavior and I was asked to give this talk to the visiting committee, which um, who uh, Renee just described. But in addition to that, this was a post-dinner talk after they had spent like the entire day wandering campus and like you know being shown all the you know the new economics building and all this stuff. And so like you know wine was being had and steak <laughs> was being consumed. Um, was as a verb, right? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then I was supposed to talk, right? Um, and part of, I think, what's, what's tricky and what's important about knowing your audience is figuring out where your entry point is. So we all try to integrate multiple aspects into our research, and, and you can fail immediately if you pick the wrong entry point. Um, and uh, so... <laughs> So I started off with, um, so the other thing is you sort of have to know your strengths and your limitations just as a human being and a, and a presenter. And um, I'm not terribly funny, but I decided to start with something that I thought would be quippy. Um, so I started with, um, let me start with something obvious, learning is important. Right, and I was sitting in front of a bunch of people who basically are invested in the University of Chicago and work hard for it. So I thought that that would at least be a reasonable little. This is going to be light, um, and it's part of what what I do. Right, I study learning potential. Um, I kept. I had slides. Um, I wonder if I had any words on any of my slides. They were all pictures. 
Um, part of what's difficult for what I do in communicating it is that, um, you know, no, no one really thinks about the animals I work on. No one really thinks about brains. These things are sort of um, intangible to most people. So I just showed them pictures of everything. Um, and all I did was tell the story. I told them why I thought this was cool, sort of what we were doing, but, but not how we were doing it, just why we were doing it and what, what we could learn um, from what we were doing. Um, the thing with jargon, if I can insert something here, sometimes it's actually useful to give them one or two terms that you know you're going to use and that are really central for um, th that flow throughout your story and that you can give them to sort of lock onto as you move through the story. And so you just have to make sure that you define it up front. You know, this is this is a jargony term. I'm going to tell you what this is, and then just use it very specifically over over and over. Um, <clears throat> But I think the only reason why anyone understood what I was talking about, if in fact that's, that's the case, was that um, these are smart people, right? You're always dealing with very smart people. I didn't tell them anything technical. I told, I told them why it was cool, basically. Um, and, and we all do things that we think are cool. And sometimes forget it, because we're, we're trying to get the fine details worked out. But you have to tell people why it's cool. I think that uh, at least the stage I'm in in my career is I'm not only telling a story, I'm saying why I'm the best person mm -hmm. to tell that story, publish on that story, and sell that story to other people. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you integrate, um, like, well, why should these investors, like, invest in you, invest in you, Chicago, um, when, like, how do you present yourself as the person that should tell this story? Um, how does that get laced into? So maybe other people want to weigh in, but I'll, I'll, I'll give my two cents. Um, I, think, I think you have to be really careful. I think one of the mistakes that people make is that, um, is that the goal of your presentation in whatever format should be about teaching. Um, it can't be about being impressive. Because if you're trying to be impressive, you lose people because because your your target audience is is you right you if you are the one to do it you are the only one to understand what you're doing and so if you talk like you would talk to yourself you lose everyone else um, and so um, and so this is hard right because everyone is trying to place themselves in a way where they get credit for what they do and that and and you've worked so hard to to try to get credit for what you do so you can go do more of it. Um, but there's a way of telling the story where you say, here's, you know, here's this gap, right? Why are you the only one who can do this? Because there's this gap. And there are these other people doing this other stuff, but there's this hole in the middle of our knowledge. And this is what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to tell you about how I identified this hole, and I'm going to tell you about how I'm filling the hole. Does that advice change at all if you're writing a grant application or, or it's exactly it's yeah. exactly what a grant application is actually here here's what we do know here's this huge unmet need someone needs to understand this thing in order to sort of populate our knowledge base and here's how I'm gonna do that and here's what the outcome is gonna be here's here's what the world will look like when I'm done filling that gap so it's more about recognizing a unique entry point into something and that you're the person who is going down that road as opposed to um, being maybe a little tooting your own horn through the whole presentation kind of thing. You have to do it, You yeah, you just have to be careful. Um, you just have to be careful to not be, if, if you tell the story right, people are impressed. And a, the end game is to get other people to appreciate what you're doing. And the only way for them to appreciate what you're doing is if they understand it. And, and so you have to, um, you know, this is the communication part, right? You have to figure out how to tell them the story. And, and you're there, 
right? It's all your stuff. Make sure you put your citations on the bottom of your slides when you're first author and whatever. Don't be shy, but it's, it's, about, it's about how you think about the problem. Well, for grant applications in particular, though, sometimes what you're going to be doing when you're talking about the existence of that gap is explaining why some previous research hasn't filled it, okay? Now, there are a couple of different ways that you might go about that, okay? One of which is to just talk about flaws in previous research, but another of which is to just talk about why the problem that everybody's working on has been difficult to solve, what have been the obstacles in the way of resolving this problem, okay? Um, there's wide variation in academic fields according to how accepting people are of attacking previous researchers. In the humanities, it's just what people do, okay? <laughs> it, really? it used to be that everybody <laughs> thought that, however, they were wrong. They're you know, dumb. that kind of an opening is pretty much standard, all right, across a wide array of ways that, I mean, yeah, I know, it's terrifying, isn't it? Scientists, okay, who work together in laboratories and have to face each other in the morning <laughs> are horrified by this idea. Yeah, don't, so do that, that. don't do that in the sciences, or, or in the uh, empirical social sciences either. But what you can do is say, okay, we've all been in this together, we've all been working on this problem, this person solved this part of the problem, this person solved the other part of the problem. Um, there were obstacles, okay? Um, we didn't have enough computing power in previous research, okay? Um, we didn't have this new theory. We didn't have this new bit of data coming in from over here. Now all of these things are coming together, and this is the timely moment, therefore, to fill this gap that everybody has been interested in filling, and here are the resources that we have at this university, at this lab, in my research, in order to fill it, that kind of thing. So shaping that gap is one thing we can do. Yeah, I think just to echo those and maybe give a different spin on it. I think whether you're presenting or writing about your own research or any form of communicating your research, you shouldn't shy away from uh, providing the context. And like even in a presentation, I think there's like a impulse to get to your work as fast as possible and say, here's all the things I did. But if you spend more time establishing the context and establishing sort of the stakes, what's at stake? Uh, around your research, um, it gives more meaning to when you do get to what you're what you've done, and they can especially when you're talking outside of your field. It just like it puts it like it it shows what you've added onto or how you've contributed to this broader either debate in your field or a quest for knowledge. Um, so it's all about I think as you did at the visiting committee talk, starting at like you know forty thousand feet and establishing like the big huge meaning of this. You know. Climate change is going to kill everybody on Earth. And then, you know, bring it down. Take your time bringing it down to, all right, here's the central question that I'm addressing, and here's what I've added to it. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to spend <clears throat> a significant amount of time setting that up. So this is a, sort of connects a little bit, but um, what about humbleness as a presenter or a writer? Um, and, and is there a place for that? Um, the, the ability to say, I don't know. The, you know, to admit that there's, you've gotten to the point in a presentation or something like that, or questions are coming at you, where, you know, how, is, what's the best way to handle a situation like that when you're dealing with an audience um, that maybe is not technical? So, I don't know, do you want to, Sarah, do you have any perspective If on you that? don't know, you should say, I don't know. <laughs> um, but then, you should say, but I do know these other things. And so if I had to posit, you know, an educated guess on the answer, I would, I would think that this would be the answer and sort of lead them through your, your thought process. So, so you never want to just say, I don't know, um, because, because that doesn't actually give you a, a chance to showcase what, what, you, what you do know. And that, that is, that's part of what you're doing too. And sometimes people ask really cool questions. Um, that, that no, one, no one knows the answer to. Um, and that can be another place to, to, again, sort of place your work in, in some broader context and illustrate how, how much work there is left to be, to be done. And if you can um, provide some, some information about the general concept, then, then you've done even what, what you were trying to do, which is demonstrate that, that you're a person who's capable of, of of, of being there. Yeah, you could say, I don't know, but I have an idea. Yeah, exactly. And if you give me this job, <laughs> I'll test that idea. <laughs> that's, a, that's bold. Yeah. That's bold. <laughs> that specific wording is bold. Yeah, it's subliminal. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's the, maintain the expert that you are 
you are an expert in this area, but it's okay to kind of admit that. No one knows everything, so. right? That's, that's, uh, we're all here because we don't know a bunch of stuff. And we're trying to know more today than we knew yesterday, but that's that's all we can hope for. So, so not knowing things, I mean, you have to be careful, right? There's a certain level <laughs> at which you should know things, um, <laughs> but but beyond that reasonable expectation, um, just think just think it through. It's okay. Okay. Um, Tracy, what? A question Did we have there. a question? Okay, yeah. Um, on this topic, but it seems to me that everyone's talking about <clears throat> presenting work that doesn't appear to be a work in progress, but is close to being finished. But often I find we're asked to talk about our work for grant applications or even present on our work when we're still in the throes of figuring things out. Do you have suggestions about how to talk about our work well, we have some ideas, but it's not we're not quite there ready to prove them yet, or we still have a lot of other questions that we need to explore, or maybe our research up to this point has not helped us at all, and we need to kind of change course. Like, how do we talk about that intelligently um, and in a way that's coherent and palatable for our audience? So is this mostly for, like, presentations that you're giving, or more, do you, are you being asked to write about this as well? well I mean, like, Personally, I've had to do both. Yeah. Um, okay. And I have some of my own ideas, I guess, about how to approach that. But I'm curious about what you all think, especially because I come from the social sciences mm -hmm. and not the biological or physical sciences. So. Well, so are you doing? Are you doing empirical work? Or are you doing more conceptual work? I'm a historian. Yeah. Um, okay. That answers your question. <laughs> it's empirical and conceptual. Again. I don't know. I mean, I think. <laughs> I don't know, but here's what I think. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think hire me, I the best thing you can do is kind of give everything like the most optimistic spin possible, <laughs> like a sort of learning from adversity spin. Um, and I, I think, so w when you're presenting to a scientific audience, especially they realize that science is a process, that science doesn't always work, that you learn as much from things not working as things working. Um, history is a little out of my expertise, but I imagine it's, there's similar, similar things there. So it's really about, you know, uh, I, I think you can turn that into a pretty interesting talk, because probably when you did hit a dead end, you had ideas about a different way of going. Um, so I don't think, I think there's, so it's kind of like optimistic but realistic. Like don't shy away from admitting that things didn't work because usually you could learn a lesson or, or at least a new direction from something not working. Um, and I think particularly if you're at a job talk or something like that, people will uh, respect that, will be impressed by that um, because that shows that you can problem solve, which is really all getting a PhD is about, I think, in any field. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, you know, it, it, to you, I, th I find this a lot when I interview graduate students, even about like when something has been published, that graduate students who have done a lot of the actual work uh, f for a paper um, tend to get really mired in the details and are less confident about uh, expressing their results. And I, I think uh, usually the PI is like, who has written grants about this and who has been through this before is more willing to like take a stance and say, we discovered this, it's gonna lead to this, like here's the big picture. Um, and I think that's a good tip for talks in general. Don't go too far, don't like hype it up or embellish it uh, you know, beyond the point of reason. But uh, you know, put, put a positive spin on things and a, a, a confident spin on things, even if they are uh, you know, semi-failures <laughs> along the way. Tracy, did and you this, have any questions? The semi-failure may not be a failure. I mean, it really depends on your field, but sometimes I didn't find anything doesn't really mean I didn't find anything. It means I didn't find what I was looking for. But if you didn't find what you were looking for, that meant that some expectation that you had was violated about what you were looking for. Now, that actually could be a major discovery. Okay. Um, remember how I said earlier that it's sort of standard operating procedure in a lot of conceptual fields to begin an introduction by saying, well, a lot of people used to think that, but it turns out actually. This could be the beginning, really, literally the beginning of a new question. I mean, I've even seen this in empirical fields. I was working once with a doctor who had gotten her grant about figuring out why clinics on the south side were, were succeeding or not by having this list of factors that she was looking at for why the clinics were succeeding or not. It was weight loss clinics, okay? 
Um, and the only, and all of her factors didn't work, okay? There was no correlation between any of her factors and anything else. And she had buried in her discussion section of the draft of this, she had this discovery that it turned out that staff turnover at the weight loss clinic was the single factor that would predict whether or not the, the program would survive, okay? And she had this, like, at the end of a sentence in this embarrassed place in her writing seminar, took a look at this and said, this is your five alarm fire. This is your discovery. You've just found your introduction. You've just found your article and several follow-up articles, okay? You've just found your new grant application, okay? So sometimes I didn't find anything. I don't know the details of your research, okay? But sometimes developing, well, okay, my expectations were violated. What did I find, okay? What was wrong with my theory? That means I have to come up with a different theory, okay? If you had the theory going in, it might mean that other people would have a similar theory going in. And so do you see how this would violate their expectations too? And that's something that's really potentially very interesting. Okay, so a temporary setback, I mean, you know, I mean this quite literally and not in a poster with a sunset. Uh, you know, on the wall sort of thing, one of those inspirational things, it really in academia literally can be true that a setback can lead you to a new discovery. Okay, all you have to do is kind of control your disappointment level a little bit and be friendly. So the, uh, Rob touches on a little, on this a little bit. Um, so a lot of times in, when you're, well, interviewing somebody, you're, somebody's talking about their research and it's mid, kind of mid-road, um, the, the impact question um, which everybody who works in media and everyone who's interviewing you or asking you about your research is wants to know is is what is the what is this going to mean is is this going to cure cancer you know is this going <laughs> to do the yes. thing <laughs> right and and it's what media is hungry for they that's the nugget that they're looking for that's the hook um, but there's going to be a delicate balance where you can use a a smaller version of that hook but to still connect with an audience whether it's through the writing or through a presentation or something like that. So, Rob, you've um, been doing a lot of writing for both, um, well, music, and you wear many hats. Um, <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that, that idea of a hook that engages a wider audience and how it changes depending on the hat you're wearing? And have you found anything, any little pieces of wisdom to kind of you can share about when you're writing about the sciences? All right. Yeah, I think it, it goes back to what I said before about providing the context. And sometimes it's just, um, like maybe it's, a lot of times your research is maybe uh, resolving some conflict in the field. And like depending on how you talk about it, it can sound like the most boring inside baseball thing ever. Or you can sort of set up the stakes. I mean, it's, all, it's kind of like a, it's a tried and true approach for writing about anything to like establish a conflict <laughs> and then resolve the conflict. That gives you a ready-made narrative right there. Um, it doesn't always fit for science, though oftentimes it does because science is like this process of clashing theories or like successes and failures. Um, so if you, the reader coming in may not like naturally have a hook, they might be thinking, well, this isn't gonna cure cancer, or this isn't going to reduce crime, or whatever sort of major issue they have in their mind coming in. But early on in your article, in your presentation, you can, the, the best thing to do is make them care about this question. That, that's the hook, is you want to like create this, you know, uh, create this problem that needs to be solved. Um, and by the end of it, hopefully you have at least some sort of re resolution for that. Yep. So uh, this is an experience, uh, a mortifying experience that I had, and, and it might, um, I, I was at dinner um, with a group of people and there was a nuclear physicist there. And he asked, like, what do you do? And I study ancient Rome, and I study women, and I study the economy. And I give him what I thought was my elevator spiel, and he's like, why does that matter? Like, <laughs> I, he's a nuclear physicist. What he does, like, I believe, probably has a, a, a really big impact. And he was the most skeptical like receptor of my research and he just didn't understand why studying something 2,000 years ago um, mattered today. And that is like when I'm out at dinner parties and such with well-educated people, like these are the kind of people I actually encounter who just don't understand and, and I guess any of you have any advice how to um, like, you know, why it, just explain to him that there's this problem and that we don't understand how women uh, uh, like interact with fulleries is not going to get him jazzed. I think the best simple thing to do is spend some time examining why you find it fascinating. Um, 
and then come up with like a, a, a version of that, like a version of explaining like I was driven to study this because X, Y, Z. Um, it and by making it personal, you can kind of and it's then it's easier to be honest and honestly enthusiastic about it um, by explaining what you think is so interesting about this. Because I mean, I would hope that you're studying something that you find interesting. Um, the other thing to do, and this is a little, it's going to make it less like of a personal story, but uh, you know, journalists are always trying to find pegs for things. Uh, you know, current events, timeliness, things that make it make any kind of story. Give a, give a, it gives you a reason to tell that story now, right, versus any other time. Um, and you can kind of do that for research, too, I think. If there is, like, relevance to the modern world in some way, like, use that as your, as the hook, as you say, mm -hmm. the peg that you can hang it on and say, you know, you probably know about, well, maybe you don't know about Rome 2,000 years ago, but you know about this, and this is how my research is going to increase our understanding of this thing that is maybe more close to your daily life. Yep. Okay, let me start here in the front, then we can, go ahead. Um, so I have a similar but different experience. My experience was that there are certain people who don't believe in my field and think that there are a lot of, um, They don't believe it should exist? They don't believe in your field? <laughs> so I'm from psychology, right? And then yeah. there are certain people who think that psychology is incredible because of da 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 uh -huh. like, uh -huh. I just find it very frustrating to have to explain why I think my field is credible and sometimes like I let my emotions take over and then it just doesn't sound like a sound argument. I don't know if you guys have any advice on how to deal with people who don't believe in the credibility of your own field. Tell us I mean actu actually I, I, that's sort of what I was gonna say. Um, so like I don't know why you were sitting next to a nuclear physicist. I'm always surrounded by nuclear physicists. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem. So maybe you want to sort through that. <laughs> some some other forum. More carefully. Um, but I, I've had this experience when I was in graduate school. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was at the Society for Neuroscience conference, standing at a bar, and some guy came up to hit on me, and I told him what he did, what I did, and he said, well, that's a total waste of time. And I just turned around and walked away. I said, this conversation is over, and I walked away. Right? Like, what are you going to say to some jerk from Caltech who, who studies cal calcium? Who cares? Right? Like, calcium does everything. What are you going to learn from studying calcium? I was trying to study genes and behavior. That's meaningful. That's psychology. <laughs> um, and, so, and so I like the peg idea. People, people want something to relate to. And oftentimes, that's why they're not listening to you anymore is because you haven't told them how what you do is about them. Um, and so the peg idea, is, I think, is a fantastic idea. But sometimes people are just jerks. <laughs> and um, you, you can't convince everyone. And I think at some point you have to ask yourself, do I need this person to understand me? And if you do, then you need to you you need to be in your own head, and you need to figure out how to keep your cool, and you need to figure out just try different angles and see how they respond. But sometimes, you know, you say this conversation is over, you turn around and, and walk away. Like you can't. It's not your job to win over the entire universe because um, you can't, you won't, you never, you never will. Yeah, because that's a lot of energy to expend. I mean, trying to make that case if you encounter these people. Now, if your field is in danger and it becomes part of your life's work to like defend that, that's probably different. But, but again, if it's a schmo on the street, like it, unless yeah. they're going to write you a check. If, if you convince them, in which case you should stand there for as long as it takes, then just, you know, some, 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 it's, sometimes it doesn't work out. Or sometimes they just don't understand what psychology is, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. So I, if, if you want to spend the time <laughs> convincing them, I think that's good advice. But I, it, that's where it helps to kind of go back to this, like, 30,000, 40,000 foot level uh, and uh, really sort of, you know, maybe change their frame of reference because they think they're talking about one thing when you're actually doing something completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so ask them, if they say, psychology. oh, I don't believe in psychology, ask yeah. them, well, what do you think psychology is? And they'll say, some, they'll say oh, like therapy. <laughs> and then you can yeah. say, no, actually what I do is, you know, study the mind, how the mind works. So, yeah. 
Go ahead. You, you, you were I love to. short talks. <laughs> <laughs> I really like short talks because this is what, you know, everyone, right, we, we've all been to school, right? So, like, you've had this assignment in eighth grade or whatever when, when like, instead of writing the eight-page eight paper, you're going to write the one-page paper. It's the hardest paper you ever write. And it's hard because you have to pick. You have to pick exactly, and every sentence matters, right? And that's what a 15-minute talk is. You're not gonna be able to tell someone everything that you've done and thought about and would like to do in 15 minutes. You're gonna pick one element of it, and you're gonna set it up, and you're gonna expand on it, and then you're gonna, you're gonna set it up, and then you're gonna expand on it, and then you're gonna bring it back, and that's it. It's this one kernel that you want them to understand deeply. But, but in terms of, but in terms of like the actual rudimentary of it, that in certain sense of, you know, you have 15 minutes. You have what? Two, two minutes to contextualize? Three minutes yeah. to contextualize? Yep. Four minutes to talk about your thing? <laughs> five minutes, like, you know, like in that sense. Right. So start 10 seconds with a joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> Do a quick dance. Yeah. Right. And then a pragmatic recommendation, a, I mean brutally pragmatic recommendation for thinking through this is the TED Talks are a great resource. Okay, and here's why they're a great resource. It's not because they're good talks, they are good talks, but because they have posted transcripts. And those transcripts you can download, you can take a look at the transcript and get a feel for how much writing leads to a talk like that. Not only do they have these transcripts posted, but they have timestamps next to each paragraph. Okay, so you can get, and by reading through a number of these in your field, you can sort of figure out how do they allocate their time, okay? And it's kind of remarkable. When you read through the thing, you can read it in about five minutes, okay? And it turns into the 17 minute talk, okay? So if you're, I mean, I think that one thing you're going to have to do in order to tell the short, that stripped down story is to see a lot of other people doing it, okay? And to be able to compare the written version. It's this tiny amount of text. I mean, in academic terms, okay, our texts are our babies and they go on for 30 pages in the morning the merrier, okay, but the TED talk, it's this tiny little thing, and you realize, yeah, okay, second by second, okay, how much of that thing is devoted to pure establishing of importance, okay, it's like five minutes of opening anecdote, okay, and then maybe like one sentence of developing the actual theory and of introducing the one key term mm -hmm. from the field mm -hmm. that they want, okay, mm -hmm. followed by example from life, example from life, example from life, and boom, that's it. Okay, so yeah, it isn't very much time, all right? The amount, the proportion of idea to explaining importance and illustration. You're gonna be prioritizing places where you're explaining importance and where you are illustrating with examples, okay? And yeah, that is where more of your space goes. It's a completely different way um, of thinking about space allocation. Absolutely true, okay, from anything you've done before. It's not just the amount of space, but how you allocate it. And that the audience piece of that is really important too. So if you, regardless of, where you're going to give this talk, understanding who's going to be sitting in that room will help tailor that a lot. You know, um, a lot of the TED talks start with a, um, a, a a bold controversial statement, and then they back up just a little bit and kind of give that context and things like that. But that's kind of roping in that idea of a hook, right? You got you have 15 minutes, and if you don't catch that audience in the first minute or two, same thing with the video, the first. 15, 20 seconds, they've floated away and they're focused on what's their gadget they have in their hands and other stuff. So um, for public, I think broader audiences, finding some way of kind of incorporating that hook early on is very important. The, the TED is something to emulate precisely because of these general audiences or is that the direction the academic should go? Well, I mean, TED Talks are meant for non-specialist audiences and that's what why they're powerful in a lot of ways. I, I mean, they, they have nuggets that show impact, right? But, and there's always a lot of actual uh, research or there's things behind it to, to kind of back it up, but it's a lot about narrative. It's a lot about storytelling and those examples that Tracy mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, I don't know if that's really the way, I mean, it's not necessarily the format you're gonna use for like a job talk or something, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's different. Right. Yeah, and what I would say mm -hmm. is that I think it's incredibly useful to come up with 15 minutes or even shorter like a version of whatever it is you study um, because that's kind of like the streamlined narrative of, of your work um, that then you can build off of. I, that, that core narrative is going to be in every talk you give, I think. Um, like it is important to change for different audiences, but I think the actual like core of the talk should probably be, can be the same whether you're talking to your department or whether you're talking to like general public. 
And then the, where you customize it uh, for each audience is by adding things on. Because you're not always going to have to shorten it down to 10 minutes. So if you're giving an academic talk to your department, you spend, you add on to that core narrative a bunch of methods um, or you know more inside field type stuff. Um, if you're talking to a general audience, you add more examples. But it's, I think it's really useful to strip everything back to this like core talk. And like this summer, I was working with a fellowship where we were making them do three minute talks about their summer project. And they like fought and kicked. And I said, only three slides for three minutes and no words on the slides and all these like constraints. And they hated it. Uh, but then it got down. I mean, we had to do like 15 talks in an hour. So we had to, they had to get it down that low. And then they gave more specialized talks either back at their home institution or at technical conferences. And then from there, you can just like, you insert slides on top of that. I mean, when you see when you know visiting professors come, they give the same talk wherever they go, and they just you know customize a few slides, and that's sort of you know the practical version of that. Like it's good to like establish you know what is the heart of my talk, and then just customize it from there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's similar to the Page of Kucha format of which I hate which, actually, but <laughs> yeah, but and that's that's even faster pace. That's like yeah. uh, thirty. 30, it's thirty seconds. Thirty slides and ten minutes or something. Some, yeah, yeah, something or like that, even, where yeah. they just. It goes too fast. Yeah, I think. it's it's <laughs> primarily used uh, in creative fields, for, like ad campaigns, but it's kind of yeah. starting to leak out into other places too. So they do these nights, like here in Chicago, and it could actually be an interesting thing to to do it to test yourself or to give yourself a, a an opportunity to do something completely outside of the way you would ever present is to put together one of these presentations and show up for one of the nights here in Chicago and just give it and see how it goes. It, you know. Take yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, for sure. I have a related question to what we've been talking about, which is, um, so in my work, kind of like part of my intellectual project and commitment is actually countering popular narratives and ideas about the world. And so like on the one hand, there's like a peg out there, or a number of pegs that I could hang my research on. Um, kind of like, well, we know X is Y. But actually, what I'm really trying to do in my research is be like, X and Y, totally unrelated to each other. Um, but, so I don't know if you guys have any experience in like how to do that without like, you know, sitting them down and giving them a seminar for like 10 weeks on like, here's how we understand that the world, you know, in our world, X does not actually equal Y, even though that's like what we grow up and kind of internalize. Um, so I don't know if, because I mean like, obviously that's hard and have to balance like being true to you know like what you're really doing versus like what will get you grants or like what you can tell the New York Times reporter and what they'll write down. But so I don't know if you just like have any you know like personal strategies for dealing with that. Well, I think like the everything you know about X is wrong angle is like it. it yeah, it, it's not a like classic in a one. Way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's always there's an audience for almost everything, but, <laughs> right, but yeah, yeah. I think you could look to popular physics writers for ideas on this. So like Brian Greene, Elegant Universe, those kind of people who are thinking, you know, the way you learn science in elementary school is just wrong. And so reading through those and figuring out what sort of techniques are they using. There's a there's an element of controversy in what you're saying too, mm -hmm. and that's its own peg for sure. And I think that's kind of what Rob was getting at is that um, without it being quite as big and flashy as everything you've learned about this is wrong, there is still an element of this is a popular conception of this thing, and I'm doing something to undermine that. And that has its own, even if it's I mean within a field especially, it's going to have its own kind of uh, so maybe pulling that out. Um, could be one strategy. Do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, this? I mean, it, it's gold to be able to tell people that they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> people love to be told that they're wrong, actually. You might think that, but actually, okay. If you're really nervous, though, about active hostility, that is, if people are anticipating being told that they're wrong in a certain way, as being told the capitalist system is a bad idea, there's a, people know that there's a controversy about that, and they know that there are people who think that that's wrong. 
Um, so there, you know, it's, it, it depends on your audience. If you're doing academics, you're going to want to attack some, not necessarily the idea that capital, people believe that capitalism is good, but one of their reasons for believing that, okay, that is drilled down to their reasons for supporting their position, okay, and destabilize that, okay. Mm -hmm. If you're writing for a more popular audience, this one, this one is a toughie, okay. Right. It's a very tough sell because it's an argument that everybody thinks that they know something about and where everybody has is really entrenched in their positions. If you're trying to do it for a popular audience, this is an example where I would start with a human interest angle of some kind, starting with a story about a person, okay? Um, that's not something that I would always recommend, but in this instance, big controversy that everybody thinks that they know something about already. So the minute that you try that destabilizing move, they're gonna think that they know where you're going and they might try to toss it aside, okay? So one thing, you know, one possible option for that is you may think that all people who hold my position are gonna argue X, but actually I'm gonna argue Y, okay? So you can destabilize their preconceptions about what they think that a person like you would argue, okay? Or go the human interest angle a little bit more and, and, and go a little bit more into storytelling mode. It's a very tough road to hoe. Some rows that people have to hoe are tougher than others, okay? And I agree that, yeah, that yours, where you're talking to nuclear physicists, yes, okay? <laughs> if you are simply Sounds facing like a, a case of misogyny, yeah. Yeah, the guy's just a jerk. Yeah, okay. Okay, on the other hand, okay, if you want to build a case in society that ultimately will create conditions where he feels more uncomfortable about articulating that idea, or where people feel more uncomfortable about, you know, automatically dismissing your point of view, then you're going, you're still going to be looking for consequences that people care about, that other audiences, maybe not the immediate audience you're talking to, but somebody who semi agrees with him. How can you locate something that in it for them, okay? So imagine somebody who isn't quite the most hostile version of your audience, but somebody who's a little bit less hostile, okay, and try to work towards their interests. What will count as a hook for them, okay? What will count as something that challenges one of their ideas in a way that interests them, okay? And then see if by building allies, I mean, that's in part what public communication is supposed to be for, is building allies for your position among people who might not necessarily be part of the converted group. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is about job talk presentation. I was told that it's a good idea to present the completely research paper only, but if I have excited ongoing research project, which might better fit in that particular school I'm applying for, is it also okay so that I can get some data? I'm going to. Do you want to take this one? You're yeah. nodding, so. Um. <laughs> I see absolutely no problem in presenting projects that aren't completed, especially anywhere. Um, again, you, you have to have something to say about them, but I mean, I've, I'm trying to remember my job talk. Um, but you know, I think the last bit of my slide was, I, ha I have this idea, I've done, you know, this, tiny little bit of work to, to test it, but here's what I have so far, and if this pans out, then this is what it would mean. And that, that, was, that was the end of it. Um, there are, I think, some fields where people are, um, where maybe that's not a, a cultural norm, and so I think you have to be careful of that. For us, presenting um, partial experiments is, is pretty normal, because it takes forever. Um, and the only other hesitation I ever have about presenting things that aren't published or close to done is if I think there's someone in the room who's gonna um, try to beat me to the answer. Um, but I don't see any reason why, you know, what, what you're doing now is, is the most current thing. If it's already published, it means it's three years old. At least in, in my world, that's three years old. So you wanna present, the momentum of your work, especially in a job talk. So um, if the best way to do that is to present what you're working on currently, I would do it. If you, I mean, the, the aspect of, uh, you also want to, sh to tell this hiring committee, whatever, that your research is fruitful, that, that this is your job talk, but that there's things in the pipeline, right? I mean, indicating that there's a, a longer term uh, output to your research is only going to be powerful I would think I mean uh, that that will indicate to them that that you 
have vision and will be heading in a direction and that's I would maybe ask the person who gave you that advice if they had a specific reason why um because it, it sounds a little uh I don't it's confusing to me what department are you in Mm. So then I thought, oh, that's good. I mean, I can answer any question even if I can say it, though. But something presenting on web research can be exciting, so that I can mm. be that. Or I have a uh, well, clear memory. You're not going to get at a job talk. You are not giving that talk to get feedback. Oh. <laughs> you are, if, when you give your job talk, you are going to school them. Uh -huh. That is your role. Right? They will ask you questions and you need to know the answers. You have to think through the components that you don't have evidence for yet and you have to have good, good answers for those questions. You are not going for feedback. If you give a job talk, you are not going for feedback. That's why you give the internal talks to your friends and your colleagues and whatever. That's for feedback. As soon as you get on the plane, you got to own it. <laughs> But it sounds like that school had a very specific thing yeah. that they were looking for. Yeah. I'm not really sure that that necessarily would apply to every school you would go yeah, to. Yeah, that's what I've asked. Right, yeah. yeah. That sounds weird. Sure, When it comes to writing for the general public, what separates the really successful and popular writers from not? So for example, what is it that people like Stephen Pinker and Malcolm Gladwell would do that make them so freaking popular and <laughs> so many others who attempt the same thing. Is it that they hire very good co-workers for really good writers? <laughs> what, what is it that they do? I, I thought was that it, they are extremely good at pulling out colorful anecdotes and telling stories. I mean, it's all narrative. That's the, that they take their nonfiction topic and turn it into something that reads like a compelling novel. I mean, that on the surface, that's, I'll, let, I'll let you guys go deeper into that, but that... Well, I think one thing, it, it calls to mind one thing we haven't really talked about yet, which is using metaphors a lot in explaining research. Um, I do this a lot because I'm writing about other people's research. I'm not sure how well it would work for talking about your own research to some extent, and in most cases, Malcolm Gladwell's writing about other people's research and Stephen Baker. Um, I think one way to really, uh, it, it, if, if you're dealing with a tech, like a technical scientific concept that it just is really hard to link to everybody's daily real world lives, um, come up with a metaphor, say it's like this that you would experience in your like everyday life. Um, it, sometimes it's a stretch, it's like it's difficult to really find something that sort of captures the technical aspects accurately but also in a compelling way. Um, but I find that, I mean, I write about like supercomputer research all the time, and it's like as abstract as it could possibly be. Um, but sometimes it's just finding that, hey, this algorithm kind of works like a school board taking a vote type of thing. And then you lead with that, and then get down into the like more technical details further down. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell just does this all the time. He always comes up with, you know, Davids versus Goliaths and 30,000 hours of uh, practice and all these things. Um, he, yeah, he pulls in anecdotes, he pulls in metaphors, and it it's almost like you don't even know you're reading about science at some point. It's like supported sometimes. Malcolm Gladwell's a little <laughs> controversial yeah. by actual science and yeah, but uh, so I mean, it, and it's, I think it's instructive also to look at people that have taken it too far <laughs> to see <laughs> like Jonah Lehrer is the like big one sort of similar to Malcolm Gladwell who sort of distorted findings and actually made up quotes and did a lot of other crimes, uh, journalism crimes. Um, but yeah, no, I think metaphors can be super, super powerful in explaining what you do to a general audience. Did you want to say anything about this too? It's, yeah, the power to pick an anecdote. Okay, um, in, in one of my classes on persuasion theory, we spent about a week on unpacking the differences between Cass Sunstein's book Nudge. Have you ever heard of that? Okay, um, and the law review article on which it was based. Okay, it was originally written as a law review article, the title of which was not Nudge. The title of which was, 
is libertarian versus libertarianism versus paternalism and oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> that might begin to answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it was really interesting. The, the law review article began with a classic academic problem set up of a lot of libertarians think that you can't really in policy, you know, do this and that and the other, you know, control people's policy choices. It was a problem for what libertarians had previously assumed about the way that people make choices. It was a problem in economic rational choice theory. And he started Nudge with this story about somebody managing a cafeteria and trying to decide what should go at the front. Should you put candy at the front of the cafeteria where people can get at it easily, or should you put apples at the front of the cafeteria where people can get at it easily? That's the default choice. Whatever you can pick up easily, people are going to pick up more. So as a responsible policymaker, what should you put there, the candy or the apples? Okay, do you see how that? Okay, now number one, it's a concrete anecdote. Number two, it's very carefully chosen. He's ultimately going to argue that policymakers are going to want to control people's choices in this way. So he chooses food. He chooses food where people are really willing to legislate other people's behaviors. Okay, so it's not just telling a story, but telling a story where you're sympathetic to the point of view. Okay, now you could come up with a lot of other examples, okay, of controlling people's choices um, by controlling the choices that they're presented with. All right, where it wouldn't be as sympathetic, but if it's about food, first of all, you understand it really easily. It's a concrete situation, but also people are a little bit more willing to get on board with that particular subject with, with, with the direction that he wanted to take. So yeah, stories, carefully chosen stories. Mm -hmm. And the title comes from the anecdote about the elephants, right? And which mm -hmm. ends up being yeah, cover. Yeah, nudge. Okay, that is so you, know, the, you move people along by nudging. But obviously, nudge. Okay, you know, you can get that. That's what he wants people policies to do: to nudge people in the right direction, as opposed to is libertarianism versus paternalism an oxymoron? Which was perfect for the law review audience. They were all over it. Okay, and they said write a book, so he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, how important do you think is media attention on science? So. I've heard that like there can be pros and cons, so the pro is that more, more of the public knows about your work, but the con could be that sometimes you know, journalists mis misrepresents the data, and also it doesn't really help with, I guess, getting a job or academic job or tenure because people care more about published articles rather than media attention. Um, so I don't know, just an open question. So. Uh, Media attention can do a couple things for a researcher in their career. Um, the more awareness there is of, of your research, the more potential collaborators you may end up with down the line. The other thing that happens is you won't be cited unless people know about your work. So there's a lot of different ways of getting that out there, but citations are important and they do have career impact, right? So in, in some ways, what you, what you can do to uh, put your research out there can be important for those reasons, personally. Um, in terms of the misrepresentation, yeah, that's a big, big danger. I, I, um, what do you think, Rob, about <coughs> how to handle that? I think if, if you are interested in reaching out to the media or have been contacted by the media, the best thing you can do is contact your friendly university communications <laughs> professionals right. to help you make sure you have a very clear and concise uh, the t talking points, basically, mm -hmm. about your research. Uh, nothing that can be misinterpreted. Uh, the best thing you, the only thing you can do is explain your research clearly, and uh, and be you know and, and firmly. Uh, don't give it wiggle room to be distorted. It, sometimes you can't just you, you can't help it, but don't don't make it you know abstract or vague or wishy washy enough that they can you know put a knot in where you didn't say not and completely get the opposite of what you meant to say. So this makes us sound very evil, but in journalism school they teach you the tricks on how to get people to be uncomfortable in an interview and say things that they wouldn't normally say and it's always little games, little mind games that journalists will often play to, to pull things out. So one of the things that, you know, now that I've been on the dark side and I'm back <laughs> on the other side, is uh, we teach media training to faculty, graduate students, anybody who's actually like in being receiving some public attention or uh, media attention, we'll sit them down and we'll we'll run them through what an interview is like, and we'll teach them the the, the techniques on how to not fall into those little traps and stuff like that. Um, it's a good journalist is being fact checked, and a lot of them will actually float something to you to kind of just make sure that they're hitting the right points and things like that. 
Um, not all media is that friendly, but um, uh, there's a lot of ways to kind of prevent the, the story from going terribly wrong. Um, and Rob's right, we've got a great news office here who helps us with that. There's people like me and Rob in different departments that can help through these kinds of things. So um, We have a lot of former reporters, too, in the news office. I worked at a paper for a couple of years, and yeah. so we can like put on our evil reporter hat and yeah. I mean, test you on things. I mean, <laughs> media it, training is kind of fun for that reason. Yeah. Like, for us, we get to play the bad journalist for every once in a while. And, you know, but, no, but the point is that we, we teach you to kind of see around the, you know, the long pauses and teach you not to fill in the gaps with just talking and <laughs> things like that, you know, like, so, uh, but yeah, the, I think, um, so do you find that, that pursuing some publicity for your research has been fruitful? Has it, has it been good for you? Yeah, I don't think that there's any harm in it. I, I think Renee's right that there, that there are positives in, in exposure. Um, I think the, the main cautionary tale, uh, independent of the evil press people, which I'm now <laughs> aware of, um, and I know there was an evil hat, uh, is that, you you know, that's not your job. Your job is to go to lab and uh, do rigorous research. And so if anyone who has influence over your career could perceive you as being more interested in the press stuff than the hard work of going to do the work stuff, that then it's a problem. But if you have something cool, then um, you know, shout it, shout it to the world, and then go back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw a study once. I should like keep this citation in my back pocket. But um, somebody compared articles in like the high-profile journals that were written up by the Science Times in the New York Times versus articles in the same journal that weren't written up. And the like effect on citations is like mm -hmm. astronomical. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the the thing is, and this is, applies to all communication, is that scientists don't get the majority of their news or information about other scientists from journals. There's just too many journals out there, especially out of your outside of your field. You can't you can't keep up. Scientists m get most of their information about science the same way that the general public does from newspapers, from magazines, from websites uh, that are written for a general audience. Sometimes a like educated general audience. And Science Times is you know a, like intelligently written articles. Um, but yeah, like it's like doing media is absolutely I think beneficial to your career because you're you're going to reach a much wider range of scientists, not just public, uh, than you would normally. Mm -hmm. It can be risky, however, in certain ways. I mean, the, the fact that um, we've, we've been urging you to think about consequences, you know, about explaining the importance and value for your research. One of the things that newspaper reporters will try to do when they're talking to researchers is, you know, we leave the long silences from which you can talk. But another, which is they're walking in with the knowledge that they're going to have to put some kind of value onto your story that will be sellable to their editor, okay? Um, and so therefore, if you don't walk in there yourself with some idea of what the value might be, they will impose it on you. Now, one reason why I'm so concerned to warn you about this is that somebody that I'm working with right now just had this problem. She's doing research in um, the genetics of the Inuit in Denmark, okay? And she had somehow or another managed to get blood samples from 8% of the Inuit population, okay, in order to do this vast genetic study on relatedness among the Inuit. And this uh, uh, Danish website got interested in her research and is doing a story right now on it, okay? And they've been negotiating about it this week. Um, and the first version of it, the headline was, so who did the Eskimos notes, note change of term? They didn't use Inuit, they used the Greenland, uh, they used the uh, Danish equivalent of Eskimos. Who did the Eskimos have sex with? Okay, <laughs> that was the headline. And there were all of these jokes about people sneaking into the Eskimos igloos in order to have sex with them to figure out, oh, it was awful, okay? Um, and so this woman was in tears. Okay? Now, the guy was doing his job, okay? He was trying to sell the story on genetic relatedness Okay, um, to a website that is, you know, a popular website. So um, there was a lot of begging and pleading this week over email. Okay, because for, and you know, and she's, you know, my student said to me, she's a postdoc over in genetics, um, and she, she said to me, what am I going to do? And I said, 
throw yourself on his mercy. Does he know how old you are? And she said, what does that have to do with it? And I said, tell him how hard you have been working on this research. I could, because they were all worried, we're going to lose our research subjects because they're going to lose trust in us if this comes out, okay? Because this feeds into all of these stereotypes that are out in Denmark, okay, about this particular population being thought of as being, quote, promiscuous, unquote, okay? So it was like a nightmare from every possible perspective. Um, and so we kind of sat down and we worked on how she could come up with better consequences, okay, um, that he could actually sell to his editor. And so it turned into this big question of, so do we know, you know, how many people from Denmark have Inuit ancestors? It turns into a kind of a different question instead. And into a story about these brave young researchers, okay, gaining the trust of the community because he realized that he could use that human angle that she used as her begging point for please don't turn this into an article about sex. Okay. Now again, this guy wasn't a mean person. It wasn't Darth Vader that she was dealing with, but he had a job to do, and his job was to, you know, to get a head count. Okay. And so, if you do a little bit of thinking in advance about, well, how can you tell your story in a way that, the, then, if you find yourself talking to the press without one of these good people on your side, God forbid that this ever happens to you, because they can really help you out. Okay. I've done it without that aid, and it's horrifying. Okay. Um, so, if you don't have them on your side, you will be prepared already with some lines that you can use, that you can give some direction to the story, okay? So it really pays, even if you're going to be doing, think, doing it through the press, okay, to be thinking about what the general public might possibly find to be a value in your work, because if you don't put that value on it, they will, and it might not be the value exactly that you would choose, like sex and igloos. Okay? <laughs> so um, aside from press doing things like this, we recently had an, an incident where there's uh, a congressional hearing about the value of some research funding that was lumped into, um, I think, a big NSF or NIH package, and they had subpoenaed uh, research records from one of the faculty members in the division, and they, this particular senator was planning to attack, like, you know, so I mean, and, and it was really uh, very much, uh, there's no value in this. Why are we spending taxpayer money on it, right? And uh, w luckily, he chose not to use this person as the anecdote he threw out there in testimony. But we had to do, we worked with the news office, we worked with a lot of people to um, contextualize that research in a way that was not going where the senator on, like, where he was glancing over it kind of pulled the worst possible interpretation possible and was throwing it out there. So it's not always just press, but there's value in thinking about how to frame some of these things that way, even just in case by some horrible luck that your research gets pulled for something like that, right? Like, it, yeah, so there's a lot of implications. It's, it can be sticky. There's sort of lots. I, I have this concern. I study evangelicals and atheists in the last 10, 19 to say controversial things, and they can make controversial things about each other. And so there's always a concern when I'm trying to present both of them think that I'm just going to be a like, shot in the middle of them. Um, and so like even in a small presentation, it's very hard to pick which quotes are valuable because they can come off as very offensive um, and could upset audience members just like, you know, for example, say a lot of bad things about gay people on the evangelical side. So like how do you sort of create the distance to say this is important for understanding these people, but I'm not going to endorse this idea and I don't have like 10 minutes to explain like this doesn't represent this lieutenant, it's associated with It's an interesting situation to be in. Um, Wait till the end because it's kind of specific. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think one thing is that you, you, you're going to have to trust your audience, and um, you're going to have to trust your audience, but you're going to have to um, instill in them from the get go that this is an academic uh, pursuit. Right, and um, these guys might have better ideas about how exactly to do that, but um, I this is not this is not the same. But um, it, my graduate work studied sex differences, and in fact, NIH would give me a grant only if I took the word sex out of the title. Um, it was sex differences in androgen synthetic enzyme cytochrome P450. You know, like it was clearly not, but. <laughs> they made me take sex sex out of the title. Um, but you know, 
own ads is a thing that we talked about all the time. And, and um, you know, every once in a while I'd be giving these talks and I'd look out at these people and I'd think, I just said testes four times. <laughs> um, and no one laughed, like you're laughing because this is a ridiculous little story to be telling you guys. But you, like, that's the point is we're in this forum and, and they're adults. So you have the title of your talk, you are there to present your work and they came and I think, you know, you are probably going to be in a position where your questions might reflect more on your audience members than on your presentations. And so that's going to take um, probably some, some uh, will. Um, but then I think you present it the way you think about it, which is as an exercise in understanding the specific questions that you're interested in. And they are quotes. Make sure you got the little <laughs> liney things. Um, and they'll follow. I think you have to trust them to follow your tone. And your tone is a good one, usually, Joe. And so you have to present it why you're interested, just like everyone else, why you're interested in it, how you're going to do this in an unbiased way. And this is what you find, right? The quotes go in context. You're not just going to put up, and then and then this guy said, you know, and then this other guy said. You're you're putting up the quotes for a reason, and you just are going to have to be really, really clear and really professional about it. I think the yeah, the context part really important, and I mean, in any presentation you give to a, a wider audience, uh, it's really important not to talk down to the audience. You have to have to respect the audience, and you have to assume they are intelligent and you know that kind of thing and I think to Sarah's point that's exactly the space you need to be in right um, contextualize and and, it, and in this in a situation like this uh, I would say that being a little bit more analytical and clinical in your approach is going to do you some favors as opposed to being the storyteller and I mean because that that could frame it a little bit differently and a little bit um, yeah, that's the... Yeah, it's almost like too emotionally charged already. Right, So yeah. you need to walk it back a little. You don't little need the than. layers. Right, right. The rest of us are trying to convince people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you can set that tone by using words like subjects and findings. <laughs> yeah, right. Sort of yeah. Step back a little. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It can also be helpful to have competition for the pull quote in your own prose, okay? That is, if somebody might be looking to quote something that sounds like it's the most interesting thing to quote, all right, um, they might be gravitate towards the most controversial sounding thing that you're quoting. That might be something that you're afraid of, it sounds like, uh, inadvertently per perpetuating these stereotypes by quoting them. Is that it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a dilemma of trying to present some of the things that are, they, I mean, they, they do come up to bigger than ugly. At the same time, that's not representative of the whole sample. I don't want the communities I've been studying to think, oh, he thinks we're just a bunch of idiot bigots. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's sort of hard to present the truth of the statement without painting some negative light on them. So, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's tough. It's about gain, gaining the, tr the trust of your research subjects, and that's always a difficult thing to do. This is, where, this is where keeping in mind the short presentation format for public presentations is really interesting. I mean, you can ask yourself, what quotes do I really need, okay? What, what, uh, what are, what's really going to be representative? If one quote isn't representative of the way that you think about them, then you might take a second look at why you might want to include that in various formats. But also giving names to particular ways that people talk that are clinical names, that are research-based names. This is exactly where you know, terms of art from your field can be helpful because if people have something else to call it, other than that's you know language that you've developed, okay. Other than something like oh a prejudicial remark, all right. Um, that that might be helpful, okay. That is giving people another language to discuss the thing that you're quoting, okay, rather than the one that they have sitting in their heads. So sort of assign it a tag yeah. that's mm -hmm. okay. That's research based. Yeah, from a research your, based okay. tag, okay. Rather than because people already have a tag for it in their head, okay. It, it, it's the ick tag, okay. Um, and so you have to replace that with something exactly that sounds like it's coming. So you're the expert giving them another name for it so that they can have that critical distance, a place, to, a way to inhabit that distance that you already have because you're negative. So about 10 minutes left. Um, so what I was thinking we could do is actually I was going to call on our panelists to give us a couple really tangible top couple tips that they would want you to walk away with today 
um, in, in whether, Tracy, you, you want to focus on the writing part. Sarah, you, your presentation was amazing, so you might want to say something about pre your presenting style. I just do that all um, the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Tracy, do you have a couple really tangible things? I mean, you've given us a lot of great information already, but mm -hmm. what, what would be your top couple things to walk away with? Um, this is interesting. Um, the, I think that the most important, we, we've, we've covered so many of them, the thing about metaphors, okay? Um, the thing about making sure that people have a hook, that they have some kind of a sense of the problem that you're solving, okay? The tangible way to do all this, I think, is write longer, <laughs> okay? Um, that is, if you have to do a one-page presentation, write a five-page presentation and then cut it. That's how you're going to come up with the great lines that you need, okay? Um, cut the best parts of the five-page presentation and put them into the one-page presentation. I mean, one of the things that we teach people how to do is, is to make sure that they a, articulate a point somewhere and put it up front, but usually the only way that they can do that is write their way into their sense of the point, write their way into the sense of the problem, okay? Um, we strongly advocate, especially for something that's supposed to be an oral presentation, um, that you write something out that's much longer than you think that you're going to need and then cut, 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 cut. That habit that people develop of writing conference papers in the hotel room immediately before, yeah, I'm seeing some guilty faces. <laughs> okay, look, you've got to break yourself of that habit as visual communication, as spoken communication becomes more and more important. It may turn out that by the middle of your academic careers, if not even early on in the academic careers, those kinds of presentations turn out to be more important to the, or at least as important to the ultimate success, okay, of your academic career than things that we now think of as conventional journal publications. Okay, um, I think it's actually much harder to do a successful paper talk than it is to write a successful journal article. Okay, so in other words, write long and then cut, 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 cut. That's my advice. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> then cut it again. Don't be precious about your. <laughs> yeah, cut yeah, it. Yeah, should be more touched. Uh, presentation. Okay. So some of these are, are really basic. I'll say them because I, I think that they're true. But um, what, you know, one point per slide, the less words possible. If if they draw a picture, if you can, if you absolutely can, take the words off your slide. Um, you want people to be listening to you. Um, which is part of the reason why you take the words off your slide is because they're just going to read it. Um, which means you need to map out exactly what you're going to say. Um, I do this much less now because I don't have time, but at, at your stage, um, I had bullet points. I worked through my talks to the point where I had bullet points for each slide and I knew exactly, I wrote them, I printed out the slides so I could see them along with the words that I wanted to say and that's how I learned it for myself. So when the slide came up when I gave the talk, it was, you know, it queued up the, the bullet points that I had written for the slide. You're, you're gonna be giving, um, need to be about your work and I, so I'd write that piece first. It should be most of the talk. Um, you know, for a 15 minute talk, uh, probably nine or 10 minutes of it should be your stuff. And then you write the introduction based on what your audience needs to know in order to understand and appreciate your work. That's the only thing that goes in the introduction. And it, for a 15 minute talk, like the, the question before, that's probably a couple of slides. That's it, a couple minutes. And then the end, big picture. Um, just expand out for, for the time, but build your story first. And then the only other components that go before that are what your audience needs to know to understand and appreciate your work. That's your goal. So I don't know how quickly we can answer this question, but what if your research is heavily data-based? Like like mine, <laughs> I think. Right. Usually, I right. try. Because I, I I know that that's especially I think it happens a lot for economists. Right. They're going to do a talk and they've got data. I mean that's what they've got. They've got data. So so what do you do with that? So they've got data that means something. Right. And they've got data that can be put in graphs. Um. Or they've got data where you can put up a 
stupid little, you know, Google picture of two people talking because you're making a point about communication or something. Um, you want people to be listening to you because you should be the one who's, who's guiding them through your story. You don't want them to be looking at your slides. And this is part of what's hard is that, you, I mean, everyone has data of some kind, I think. Um, and so it, it just needs to be graphical and you need to tell them why. Okay. That's what I was trying to get you to say. Yeah, that's exactly okay. Oh. <laughs> no, because of, because of the audience for for like this kind of um, non-specialist, broader, um, putting charts and graphs and meticulous data sets up on a screen, you've lost them. They're gone. Like you just yeah. So that's that's yeah. what I was going. I think with. data visualization <laughs> is incredibly important mm -hmm. now more than ever and. I wish I knew more about it. I'm trying to learn more about it because I kind of think to some extent writing a big long article is not really useful mm -hmm. anymore. And I'd rather be able to just like make one great infographic or one great, not you know, a traditional scientific graph, but a, more like a newspaper graphic that explains it in one shot. Um, especially as you know, I write about big data, quote unquote, stuff all the time, and that's you really need to break it down to, to one image. Is yeah. that is that your one of your takeaways? Is Learn something Learn about something data visualization, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but more simply, usually when I'm on a panel like this, people ask me how to become a science writer, and I have like the dumbest but probably most valuable advice is just to write. Um, like just write and practice. It's very Malcolm Gladwell of me, I guess. But um, you know, something, an exercise I thought of actually sitting here over the last hour and a half. Um, I was always, I, when I was a grad student, I was terrible at talking about my research. I, and I still, a couple times when I was at the hospital news office, I had to write about my advisor's research, which was pretty close to what I studied. Um, and it, it was awful. Like, I slipped back into the jargon and, like, technical terms that I would never use to talk about anybody else's research. So I think actually a good exercise would be to try and write about one of your colleagues' research. Write about somebody else's research, or a friend, anybody else that's not your research. And then take a look at what you have written or what you have come up with as like, I don't know if you could, if, you, if you're not comfortable writing, like prepare a talk that would explain their research. And then look at that and how that works, what works there and what doesn't work, and then try and superimpose that back on your own research. Because I think sometimes, I, I know as a grad student, you're like buried in your work and you're so close to it that it's really hard to get the perspective that you need to explain it to anybody else. So I haven't tested that exercise, but I think it might be, it might be a good one. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't really talk much about video at all, um, and that's a big part of what I've done for the last ten years at, here at the university is is uh, translate research um, visually into video, and uh, th they're fun. They're they're a nice concise way of doing things, but there's actually I think increasing value uh, in producing short videos about research. Um, for example, they actually do meet some of the criteria about the broader impacts um, statement that you have to include in grant applications and things like that. So producing a short three to five minute video is considered outreach and you've satisfied certain aspects of some grants doing this. Um, the, other, the other part of it is that journals are now asking or selecting certain um, papers that have been submitted to submit a video abstract along with their papers um, and there's certain pressures for why that's happening part of it's that a lot of journals um, their traffic is is very important to their sites and video planks uh, places higher in search than text based entries do so they've realized this and so now they're asking for video and things like that so um, my my takeaway is that don't discount video as a way to, to communicate with general audiences. It's, it can be a little intimidating because there's some technical aspects to it, um, but you should come to next week's session because we are going to dive into like how to produce some of those little short videos with like no money or very, very little money or borrowed stuff or whatever you can get your hands on and kind of how to do that to, to better present your work broadly. So, um, Is there any final questions? We've probably got to maybe room for one before we can before we wrap up okay well thank you very much for coming thank you panelists for being here